Welcome back to channel 37. We have a really cool module for you guys today. It's pretty exotic. We haven't seen many videos on it. It's the Kasutronics Quantizer. Full transparency, I actually built this one a while ago when Lily was preparing for her final exams and didn't have that much time to build. But because of a small problem with the build, we had it shelved until we came back to it recently. Now, this is a really great module. There are few modules that nearly everybody needs. They're not always flashy, but they are super useful. And one of those is the quantizer. A quantizer takes control voltage and snaps it to the nearest semitone. So you can turn a random sequence of control voltages into a relatively pleasing melody. There are many ways to compose melodies. For example, I like to write my melodies down on a staff because I compose really um, long lyrically and melodically. But for example, Casper likes, <laughs> likes to generate his uh, melodies algorithmically. How this works is you take a um, control signal from an LFO or an envelope or a random generator and process it through the quantizer, which produces a melody that you may or may not like, but you have the power to control. There are several options for quantizers in the Eurorack realm, including at least one DIY project. But here's what I like about this one. First of all, I found this obscure blog post that showed off a really cool quantizer. Then I looked up the manual and once I realized all the options that this one has, all the functionality, I realized that the Casutronics quantizer is miles ahead of the rest. So I sent an email to Casutronics in English because they work from Finland. And I was really surprised when I got an email back in Dutch from a guy with the same name as me, Casper. And I realized we were fated to build this specific quantizer module. Digging even deeper, I looked into the manual and the build documentation and they had a strong familiar feel because they were written like scientific documents. And it turns out that just like me, the designer of the Cassotronics quantizer is a scientist, although he's like a quantum physicist <laughs> working on a quantum computer. Compared to that, I imagine a quantizer is child's play, but it has some really neat tricks up its sleeves. The first is that by using a clever trick with pulse width modulation to filter the signal, it achieves a very accurate quantization at a fraction of the cost of other modules that use a digital to analog converter. Aside from those technical aspects, the module also has several musical advantages. Absolutely. One of those advantages is that the module layout is much more musical and user-friendly than other quantizers. Many quantizers are laid out in the form of a keyboard, not taking into account that the scale repeats into the next octave. This quantizer is uh, laid out in a circle, which represents that very clearly. A further advantage of this is that you can actually rotate to be able to transpose more easily. Many other quantizers would require another module to do the same work. There are a host of additional functions, including a keyboard functionality, that are directly accessible from the front panel. So there's no menu diving, you just press the shift button and the secondary function of all the keys in the circle of notes is displayed right there on the front panel. So it brings a lot of additional functionality to your rack. And finally, let's not forget that it is a dual quantizer. So you can quantize two musical parts or a melody and a bass line. All in all, it's a high quantity of quantization. <laughs> Right now, this module is still a little bit exotic, which is why we're one of the first to build it. But uh, Thonk plans to carry these modules and because it's so nicely built, we think it's gonna be very popular in the years to come. In this video, we're gonna break with our typical form. And this is because Casper really did all the building of this while I was busy preparing for my final exams. So instead of doing the introduction, the build and the review, we're gonna do the intro and the review all at once, and then the build video. And as usual, the music that accompanies the build was composed using the module. So let's get straight to reviewing. Uh, first of all is the face category. What do you think of how it looks? Uh, I think it's gorgeous. Honestly, like the wooden vibes are reminding me of like Waldorf school, very cozy candlelit wax, excellent. However, I will note that for most people it won't like fit super well aesthetically into their rack because I think most are going for a more like dark black vibe. But what do you think? Well, at first I didn't like the wooden front panel and I even thought about making my own front panel. 
but it is a really nice quality. It's very fine wood, laser cut with a printed white and black overlay. Uh, it looks pretty classy. Now, if you don't like the wooden vibes, I've heard that Thonk intends to carry an aluminum front panel for these. So maybe you'll have your pick of different options when you get to build this one. The second category is Crave. Do we want it? This is one of the modules that I wanted the most because what I experience a lot with composition is that I have one really good idea, like for a bass line, drum line, melody, whatever. And then I need to create some other parts to audition just to see which ones work well with that original idea. And a quantizer can be super helpful there because you can generate some kind of algorithmic because you can generate some kind of algorithmic patch and then snap it to the correct notes that match your existing ideas. So I really wanted this. What do you think? I really like it because it's really accessible to me in that I feel like I can really experiment with the melodies as we're composing. It really caters to playful experimentation. And the next category is the groove category. Does it groove? It's absolutely what we go to anytime we're needing something quantized. So I think it's a winner. The only potential hang up that I have is that when I tried to quantize the Manus Eteritas with this, um, it didn't really sound like the notes that I had selected here. So what I think is that perhaps the Manus Eteritas uses a pitch offset instead of full per octave, but I'm not quite sure. However, most of the modules that we've controlled with this tracked its full per octave perfectly. So it has worked for us nine out of 10 times. So that's a great look of it. And finally, the noob category, which I will leave completely to Casper because I was locked in a practice room pretty much the entire time this was happening. So it's a reasonably difficult build, but not for the reasons you might be thinking. This build has two PCBs, one of which has a bunch of surface mount components and the other of which is all through hole. Guess which one is the most difficult? It's not the surface mount parts. We're going to show you a really cool trick in the build video of how we just make short work of surface mount components. So that wasn't a problem. It was done very quickly. But what was extremely challenging about this is all of the through hole parts because they are so meticulously and tightly spaced on the board that that was quite a challenge. And secondly, an unexpected problem is that we were hit by the chip shortage. When we started this channel, the chip shortage was only just gathering steam. But when we got to this build, it was in full swing and we couldn't get any of these high lead buttons that are required for the build. So instead I ordered them from China and the polarity of the LEDs on these Chinese buttons was reversed, which caused the unit to malfunction. Now, with the help of our friend Stein from This Is Not Rocket Science, we basically desoldered all of these buttons and got some brand new ones that they've been using for their Phoenix 4 synthesizer. In conclusion, it's not an easy build, but it is an extremely fun one. And I would say it's a great build to practice your SMD because they are large surface mount parts. So you can hand solder them if you want, or you can use the pan baking method that we're going to show you in the build video. All in all, you'll have a lot of fun both building it and playing it. That's it for the review. Now we're going to head into the build. If you don't see us again, please like and subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much for supporting us. The kit contains a front PCB and a back PCB. The front PCB has several surface mount parts and the back PCB has only through hole parts. Right now we're going to focus on the front PCB because we have a special trick for those surface mount parts. So this is the front PCB and you see that it has many 0804 SMD parts. It's not that difficult to hand solder 0804 surface mount devices, but these chips will be a little bit trickier. Either way, I'm just very eager to try out our new technique for soldering surface mount parts. So we'll give that a try. The first thing we'll do, as always, is to clean the board. Because we want to keep the board flat on the working area, I'll use little pieces of sticky tape to hold it in place. Today we're going to work with some soldering paste. We need a fine needle to apply the soldering paste to the pads. The first thing we're going to do is to apply solder to all of the SMD pads. Make sure not to use too much solder, as this can cause problems when reflowing. 
for the ICs, you can just apply a thin line of solder paste. Now, with solder paste applied to all the pads, it's time to place the parts. We start with the 100N capacitors. Next, the 2.2K resistors. Next, the 100K. Now, all that remains is the shift registers. Alright, that's all the SMD parts placed, now let's bake the board. We're following a generic reflow profile with a stopwatch and thermometer, but you could get by just using the stopwatch. Preheat the board for about 2 minutes, then ramp up the temperature. When all joints have reflowed, remove the board and place it on a pot holder. Use a soldering iron and some flux to remove any bridges from the ICs. Alternatively, you could use a hot air gun. Then wash the flux off the board. We'll start on the backboard with four high precision 10K resistors. You can also use matched resistors. These are placed as follows. Next up, another 8 10K resistors. These can also be matched, and we just use high precision resistors for all of these. Next up are 7 ordinary 10K resistors. Then, 7 15K resistors. Next up are 11 1K resistors. Place two 1 mega ohm resistors, then 10 100K resistors. Next up, four 68K resistors. Let's solder them all into place. When soldering from above, make sure the tin flows all the way through the VL. Then trim the leads. Next up are three 1N4148 diodes. Then three 1N5817 diodes. And solder these into place. Next up are the IC sockets. Note that I didn't have really long IC sockets, so I just used two shorter ones. Use the front panel to hold these in place and solder the corner legs first. Then make sure they are flush. If they are, solder all remaining legs. Next up are these ceramic capacitors. Start with two 22P capacitors. Then four 47P capacitors. Another four 220p capacitors. Then four 470p capacitors. Then six 1n capacitors. a 22N film capacitor, and seven 100N capacitors. Solder all of these into place. Next up are the front side pin headers. Place the board flat, then solder two corner pins on each of the pin headers. Make sure they are flush with the board. Then, solder all of the remaining pins of the headers. Next up are the four electrolytic 10U capacitors. Note that these are polarized. Splay the legs to keep them in place, then solder them all. 
Next up, place the two transistors. Then place the trim pots. Start with the 5K trim pot, then two 10K trim pots, and solder these into place. Place the voltage regulator and the resonating crystal. Then solder these into place. Finally place all of the remaining headers. Next up we solder the interboard connectors. I found it to be easiest to put the pin headers together with the pin sockets and then solder the interboard connectors on both boards at the same time. However, when you do this, be extremely careful not yet to solder J213 on the front board. Soldering this now will prevent you from being able to solder the jack socket later. Don't make the same mistake that I did. Next, place all 10 jack sockets. Use the front panel and attach a few nuts to hold them in place. Then solder them all. Now you see why you had to wait with soldering one of the interboard connectors. Now we solder this final interboard connector. Because the rest is already in place, you can put the board to because the rest are already in place, you can push both boards together to solder it correctly. Easy breezy. Next up are the highly switches. Note that there should be a small plastic nub that fits into the extra hole on the PCB. This is how you know the buttons are correctly aligned. Once all of the switches are placed, wiggle the front panel into place. Again, attach a few nuts. Then solder all of the highly switches. Next up are the LEDs. Put them in place loosely, then place the front panel and attach a piece of scotch tape. This allows you to solder the LEDs flush with the front panel. Next, we do a power-up test with IC U3 inserted. Adjust trimmer RV1 until the voltage on these pins reads 5.34. Then remove the front panel and make sure that the voltage between these pins reads 5 volts. If this is correct, you can insert all of the remaining ICs, including the Atmega controller. Finally, we assemble the PCB sandwich. There's a female to female spacer between the two PCBs and a female to male spacer between the front panel and the top PCB. Use washers on these top spacers and on the jack sockets. That's your Casutronics quantizer finished. Well done. We'll finish this video with a brief demonstration of the quantizer. First, let's listen to a hi-hat to keep the time. Every 16 notes, I'm going to trigger an envelope on the Zadar. This envelope is attenuated in the first channel of the Quad VCA and then passed along to the quantizer. The quantizer then passes a volt per octave signal down to rings, which is out of frame. Let's listen to rings. So we're hearing the C major scale here, although I cannot vouch for the rings being in tune. 
Let's pick a more interesting envelope shape. Now one thing to note is that at this moment the quantizer triggers a new node every time the envelope changes sufficiently to switch to a next node, but it's not in sync with a hi-hat. We can change this by triggering the quantizer. For that we use the trigger input. We can also use the gate output from the quantizer to trigger the rings. And there you have it, a musical phrase generated from an envelope by means of the quantizer. I hope you enjoy your unit very much. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. See you next time.